Hello, it's David. I'm at the Chauvin Arnoux offices today and I'm undertaking their pat testing. There's quite a lot of paraphernalia involved with pat testing. I've come armed today with my uh, Amiga pat made by Metrol and my Martindale for the uh, more awkward tests where some portability is required. However, every now and again, you may be on a site where you need to undertake a portable appliance test and you don't happen to have that kind of kit with you. Certainly, I don't carry all that on the van with me, but what I do tend to carry, of course, is a multifunction tester. And that may be a basic tester, such as this old Robin Amprobe here, or something rather flasher and fancier, such as Chauvin's new 6117. Both of these instruments, and in fact, most MFTs, will do the kind of tests we need to perform in-service inspection and testing of electrical equipment. There are a whole multitude of tests uh, within the code of practice for PAT testing, uh, but really there's only four things we need to, to do with PAT testing, four basics, I should say to check to see whether something passes or fails. And let's say we've turned up at a site and we've got an RCD trip and we suspect that a particular appliance is causing it. That appliance could of course be anything, it could be a large white goods like your fridge freezer, your washing machine, your dishwasher, or it could be something much smaller. For the sake of demonstration today, we're going to use this work light. Nothing wrong with it, I've pat tested it and it passed. Jolly good. But we're going to undertake some, uh, some tests on it today uh, to just prove that it's passed and to show how those tests can be undertaken using an MFT. First of all, we need to make sure that we're on the right COM ports and these do differ. So for example, on the Robin Amprobe, the red port is our main port of utilization, but also the blue port, which you can see probably labeled there with COM. Slightly different on the Chauvin because while that still uses the red port, the COM port on this instrument is the green port. Different instruments have different COM ports, you just need to make sure you're using the right one. So for our testing today, we're going to be using the red and green leads. I've got the 6117 set up for resistance, and the first test we're going to do is going to be a continuity test. Before I get to that, the, the first part of the pack process is a visual inspection, of course, of the equipment that's to be tested. We want to make sure that there's no missing covers, no cracks, no breaks, no dicky plug, no breaks in the leads, no exposed basic insulation, no one spilled their beer over it or any of that sort of stuff. Let's assume that this has passed, as indeed it has, it's already been through the process today, so we're, we're happy that this has passed. The, the, uh, the first part of the PAT test process, but we still suspect that this might be taking out our RCD, so there are other things we want to look at on this. So we're going continuity, we're going to test the continuity of the earthing. This is a class one appliance. This earth pin here should be electrically connected to the metalwork of the appliance. So we're in continuity mode on the 6117, and I'm going to take my red probe here, and I'm going to place that onto the earth pin of the appliance plug top. I'm going to set my green probe and I'm going to put it somewhere on the metalwork of the appliance. Now you may need to test the multiple points on the appliance of course, but uh, we're just going to go for this, this one point here and we're going to undertake a continuity test. Now the nice thing about this instrument is that it's, uh, it's on the continuous test function at the moment, so it's performing that continuity test over and over and over again to give us a continuous result. You want to make sure that you're using an instrument that does that. Not all testers do that. Some of them will just do a one-shot test and give you a result, but you need that continuity test to be running for a few seconds just to make sure that it's, it's stable. And of course, you can move the probe around on the device, uh, on the appliance and the test to make sure that you're getting consistent results throughout. But what result should we be seeing? We're getting 0.05 ohms, which is nice and low, and that's probably about what I expect it to be. After all, we are just measuring resistance from this point here to that point there, and there's not a lot of cable in between, so we expect it to be nice and low. Really, we want to see something below 0.1 ohms for most appliances, but you've got to make an engineering determination as to whether the number that's being reported on the instrument is the number you expect to see. For example, if we were testing an extension lead, a 10 meter extension lead, then the resistance of all that copper over that 10 meters, all the way up the line wire and all the way back down the earth wire would naturally be greater than 0.1 ohm. And some pack test instruments will themselves just report that as an outright fail, even though it's not. So when I say FD user engineering determination, if you look at your on-site guide, if you're furnished with such, in appendix one, we can see that's a flex that has a 1.5 mil line conductor with a 1.5 mil protected conductor will have a resistance of 
24.20 milliohms per meter. Therefore, for 10 meters, the instrument should be seeing something like 0.24 ohms total. So you have to be a bit careful as to how you interpret your results. Generally, 0.1 is kind of where you want to be, but something over 0.1 isn't necessarily an outright fail. You have to look at what it is, how far over it is, whether you think that's right or wrong, etc. But we have proven here that we have continuity between the metalwork of the appliance and the metalwork of the plug top. Super duper. So we've done the visual test, we've done the second test, which is our earth continuity. Our third test is going to be insulation resistance. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to squirt uh, 500 volts up both the line and neutral pin simultaneously and see if anything leaks back down the earth pin. Obviously the insulating materials within the flex and within the appliance themselves should be strong enough that nothing leaks from the live, wire, live pins, live wiring back down to earth. So what we can do with that, the easiest way to do that is to take a clip, clip it between those two live pins and again we're going to put the green probe somewhere either on the earth metal work or on the earth pin of the plug. We know that that's connected to that so it doesn't matter which and we're going to take our red lead and put it onto our common line and neutral pins here. Now we're going to switch this tester to insulation resistance and we're going to pump in 500 volts, that's what it's currently set for. There's no danger that this is going to damage the appliance at all because we're pumping that 500 volts into line and neutral simultaneously. There's no potential difference between them. That voltage isn't going to go across any kind of circuitry, uh, so it, it's going to be all right. And if we run that test, I have to hold down the button for this one because it, again it renders a continuous test as long as the the dead man switch is held in, it'll stop if I let go. We can see there's a danger sign because we are putting 500 volts into it, but we can see we're off scale high at over 2000 million ohms, which is a very high scale. Again, we have to uh, make an engineering determination of the number that comes back. Generally, we want to see it over 1 million ohms, 1 mega ohm, but it can be lower. If you're looking at something like heating and cooking appliances, they can be as low as 0.3 mega ohm or 300 kilo ohm. So you have to be mindful of what you're testing and what the results are and make your own determination as to whether it's a pass or fail. But that all seems fine for this particular appliance. It all looks okay. This kind of thing, it does get a bit crocodile clip happy, um, but we have proven uh, that the uh, visual test is okay, that the earthing is okay, that the IR is okay. The last thing to do, the test that generally gets overlooked with PAP testing would be a functional test, which would be to plug it in and make sure it actually starts working. And the problem, of course, with PAP testing is that you are testing the device dead. So if you had something like a washing machine, uh, you are testing that device, that appliance, without power applied. And it might be just fine without power applied, but there may be a fault with something like a motor or a heating element, which doesn't get physically connected until a relay clicks on later into its cycle, in which case that's when it might stop working or trip something out or whatever. But with the limits of, of pack testing as they are, and with the instrumentation that we've got, we can at least check that there's nothing completely untoward before we even begin. So we should be safe to plug that appliance in and hopefully it'll, it'll operate without causing us any trouble. So if we did suspect that was taking out our RCD, uh, it certainly doesn't look like it's doing so, at least uh, while it's not being, um, at least under a dead test. As I say, it all gets a little bit crocodile clip happy. There are other things we can do to simplify things. This is something I made a while ago, Qtex had a version of this. This is a pat adapter. Uh, Showband don't make one, so I can't plug one for them, but uh, Qtex do. All that this does is line and neutral are internally connected and are presented via one 4mm banana plug and the earth pin is internally connected to this banana plug. And that just saves me having to bother with putting on a clip lead uh, and mess about with crocodile clips. I can plug the appliance into there. I can plug my probes into here. And it gives me a neater, easier way of undertaking that same test, hopefully with the same results. Jolly good. Uh, simultaneously, you could make one of these yourself, as indeed I have, uh, in a more simpler manner, just by taking a standard plug top, uh, one gang socket, 
tying line and neutral together and then using something like uh, this ethos adapter or a QTEC R2 adapter to give you the presentation of your probes to plug into. There are also other instruments that are of merit here and maybe you don't want to be lugging around some hefty MFT. This is something that uh, I tend to use on test inspections. This is a digital uh, continuity and insulation resistance meter, the CA6522. The nice thing about this is when I'm undertaking an inspection and testing on site, I can leave the, the bulky MFT at the distribution board or consumer unit where it can uh, stay with all its clips on, stay with its leads on and hang around there and not be a big lump to carry around. And I can run around doing my R1, R2 testing using this thing, which is obviously a lot smaller, more portable, easier to manage. Similarly, uh, if I'm undertaking fault finding, say I've got some uh, ring break I'm trying to find, it's easier to run around with this to undertake my continuity testing between points than it is to do it with an MFT. So that's a jolly handy instrument to have. And if you, this is the kind of thing that you could sort of keep in your toolbox or on your van because it's so much smaller and more lightweight than an MFT and obviously costs a lot less. There's less risk of it being a problem if it gets knit. Similarly, I've got another version of it here, which is the, the analog version is exactly the same thing. This is the CA6513. Same thing as this, except in analog form. Uh, the thing I like about the digital form is it gives me an explicit number to write on my paperwork. What I like about the analog form is it gives me something that's easy to show to my customer. So if I'm in front of them and I want to say, we've got this insulation resistance fault, maybe they're a bit too uh, lay person, so to speak, to uh, understand what I'm talking about and numbers on the screen don't necessarily help because if I put a if I tell the customer I'm looking for a low number and this thing gives me a one I like to be one mega ohm one giga ohm one kilo ohm you know it, it, it will depend on the on the scale it doesn't necessarily make much sense but if I can go to my customer and say we want to see this needle over on the left or over on the right and they can see the needle move then that gives them something very visual that they can look at and appreciate a little more. So there's a whole range of instruments you can use without requiring a pack tester to get some information on as to whether uh, an appliance you're testing is truly fit for purpose or not. And all of these instruments will do that and are probably more readily to hand to you on a band than dedicated pat equipment.